Okay, so um, because there was a break and because there were some people asking a few things here and there, I thought I would probably elaborate a little more on live attenuated part before coming, going further. So, um, live attenuated versus other vaccines and what is, why I think live attenuated is a great strategy, though it has its own risk. Um, if you take, for example, current, uh, of late in the last 15, 20 years, there has been a spate of so-called DNA vaccines. So it's only DNA which is introduced. It could be viral DNA, it could be some other uh, Lishmanial DNA or something else or something else, but it is not exactly like a virus. Most traditional vaccines like, for example, um, you had measles vaccine or some other uh, vaccines in which there was measles, either killed measles, measles virus or, or some proteins of the virus or the bacteria are used for vaccination. So in a way, the advantage in that is that there is no chance of uh, disease because there is no live organism in it. So that's a major advantage. But the disadvantage is what we see is that the immune system is exposed to such proteins or killed virus or whatever for a very short duration because injection is given. After that, the proteins will be degraded. They will be slowly released, but they will be degraded and they do not necessarily um, reach the immune system locations exactly like the viral components would reach. So immune response generated could be different as well. So that's the reason why I think, um, two reasons as I said, uh, why um, component protein vaccine may not be or killed virus or um, irradiated bugs vaccines may not be as good as the live attenuated. But live attenuated in the past at least have shown revertal, which means whatever the mutations which had made them attenuated as me as in uh, incompetent to produce disease, some of those mutations while in clinical use changed back to what was risky and dangerous, what was mutated earlier. You have to remember that every division that the virus would undergo or the bacterium would undergo, there will be n number of mutations which will be randomly happening. So the way mutations would, uh, would uh, benefit the virus, they can also go back to the original and that is why there is a possibility of reversal to the virulent stage and that is a risk with live attenuated vaccines, whether they are viral vaccines, BCG kind of bacterial vaccine or anything else. So there are pluses and minuses, but so far what we have seen is uh, works best is still live attenuated. So that's why I have a tendency to uh, be in favor of live attenuated than many others. And there are other issues about peptide vaccines as well. Uh, I don't know whether the in the modeling, I know infectious disease modeling does not necessarily take into account post-vaccination uh, coverage and uh, how much coverage do you need and so on. But at, I thought this is related to infectious diseases, so I'm bringing it up. So if you are going to use subunit vaccine, as it is called, that subunit can be a small peptide stretch. It could be multiple peptides which are put together in as a mix and some other variations on the theme. Uh, what I was talking about as T cell responses, where the MHC molecules come into picture. So my MHC molecules are different from almost everybody else's MHC molecules. So the peptide which will bind to my MHC molecule derived from say dengue virus, most of you will not have that peptide useful or that peptide binding to your MHC molecules. So which peptide should be used for vaccination? Peptide that works for me or peptide that works for you and you and you and you? 
So that is a problem also with the subunit vaccine. But that is not problem with the whole virus because we know that whole viruses and whole bacteria do in, uh, infect all the population. So because it's a major, major mix of proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, cell walls and whatever else that is there, that mixture in itself takes care of these lacunae in the subunit vaccine. That it's good for one individual, not so good for a second individual, really bad for the third individual. These are the risks with the subunit vaccine as well. So uh, when people talk about efficacy of subunit vaccines, there is another angle to consider which population. So is subunit vaccine developed in say Europe and is it being used here? So are the HLA genes that are very commonly seen in Europe, are they the same as in India and in similar proportions so that that vaccine will also be useful? Multiple questions do come up. And I'm aware that I'm probably pouring in a lot of information which might be bumpers for you, but never mind. You can ask later on if, if there is any clarification to ask or interrupt and ask. So, <clears throat> so BCG vaccine now. Um, so it is a live attenuated vaccine and its current use in India <coughs> is soon after birth. And there has been a debate whether soon after birth as in within first 24 to 48 hours before the uh, mother and baby are discharged from the hospital, is this the greatest time, best time for vaccinate or should that be delayed by 10 days, 15 days, 3 months, 6 months and so on. And somebody, um, Sebastian was probably talking about maternally inherited, not inherited, maternally transferred antibodies across the placenta which come to the baby and those antibodies are passive antibodies acquired by the baby and they are not made by the baby so that these antibodies as proteins have half lives and they will simply disappear over about three month period. So if there are, for example, BCG, anti-BCG antibodies which are transferred via uh, mother to the baby, will the BCG efficacy go down drastically? And if that is the case, should one defer the BCG vaccination to three months or six months? These are public policy issues. When you are doing modeling and when you are especially getting into the prediction business that maybe the, this vaccine given with a take of 50% with a coverage of 87% is likely to be, these are just false numbers. I'm not, not giving any specific numbers, but that will be sufficient for good coverage and protection of the population, you do need to take these, these kinds of points into account. That's why I'm sort of bringing it up without actually telling you how to use it. So, uh, so maternal antibodies is a problem, but what people, uh, physicians in India noticed was that if the BCG vaccination was delayed, there were two problems. <coughs> One was that as it is a uh, hospitalized deliveries are very, at a, occur at a very low frequency in India. We know that. We live in urban areas, so most of the deliveries which take place in and around our population is hospitalized in nature. But in rural area, there are very few, relatively speaking, hospitalized deliveries. So <clears throat> if the hospitalized deliveries is an infrequent event, imagine tracking that baby after six months and then giving a vaccination. It becomes a public, um, whatever, a nightmare of sorts to follow up those babies and give it. Even in urban area where mothers have been delivered, have delivered their babies in the hospital and have gone home, tracking them after six months we means a lot of infrastructure in terms of manpower. A field worker has to go track, uh, request the mother to bring the baby back and then vaccinate and observe for a while that there is no uh, immediate after effects of that and then send home. This is a nightmare. So third thing is whenever it was delayed, even immune, uh, in terms of infections, the frequency of childhood TB infections was rising. Which means what even if the protection is 
there and even if it is say marginally suboptimal, it's better than not having it. So that is why the public health policy in India is vaccination within first 48 hours. One other issue which was of importance and I will just refer, uh, mention it and then move on is that whether the immune system, baby's immune system at birth is as good as adult immune system to mount an immune response. Short answer is it's reasonably competent. So we don't need to worry about that. So that is why this 48 hour vaccination business is operative in India. I don't remember actual coverage frequencies, but they are not anywhere closer to 90-95%. However, it is steadily going up and uh, one major outcome of that efficiency I'll talk in a while, but it, it is part and parcel of that. The one major outcome of that is within first five years after birth, two kinds of you know, TB infection, uh, TB diseases were very, very common. One was tuberculous meningitis, the other was tuberculous miliary disease. Both of them had very high death rates. And problem with tuberculosis is that diagnosis is not easy. That bloody slow growing mycobacterium takes three weeks before it will show its signs that yes, it is there. Now if you do PCR with uh, CSF or something or the other, it's possible. However, the mortality was very, very high and that mortality, zero to five age, uh, zero to five year age group mortality has drastically come down post introduction of the vaccine in India. So that tells us that vaccine is effective. And now I will tell you why it is not effective also. So in US and other developed countries, you do find that if there is a vaccination with BCG, it provides more or less lifelong immunity except in cases like HIV. So if there is immunosuppression, sometimes there is also HIV TB infections and uh, that, that are seen. But in non-HIV situations, in developed countries, if the PCG vaccine is given, it provides protection for a real long term, uh, lo real long duration. Uh, and I'm not sure this is, we you know I keep referring to Gwen and she's getting nervous about it, but <laughs> I don't know what is the BCG coverage status in, in, in UK now, whether it is still recommended. I think it was discontinued and then it is given only to high risk people. But for a long time, we know that in UK, USA, Australia, all sorts of developed countries, Europe as well, <clears throat> that BCG provided protection. In India, after five years, you stop seeing protection. It's the same string. It provides protection in the first five years and it does not after first five years. What's the problem? Many people have tried a lot of hand waving and I'm also going to do hand waving. However, if you are going to do modeling on tuberculosis, somebody was asking questions in the morning, I'm forgetting who was, but what about tuberculosis? So if anybody is planning to do predictions based on what is happening to tu uh, M tuberculosis in India, this is an issue that is so India specific in a sense that you do need to have data before you do modeling. What is valid in UK or somewhere else may not be valid. Why don't we have protection after five years? It's a serious question. And uh, what should I do? Because I was going through the slides and discovered that I have sl some slides somewhere. OK. So uh, this is based on the immunological memory. I'm, I'm going to uh, go back and forth because, the, as I said, slides are not properly organized. I hadn't put my thoughts together. This is another cartoon which I like to use for saying immune memory develops. And it is antigen specific. So these, were, these are the 10 million different colors as 
I keep saying this, so 10 million different T cells, 10 million different B cells, what one calls as naive, which means they have not seen what binds their receptor, T cell receptor or B cell receptor. If there is proper binding, then they will get activated, then there will be memory generation, which is what is shown here. So that if there is one antigen which is coming, and when I say antigen, it's normally protein, not necessarily 100% accurate statement, but a piece of protein which will trigger a response, okay, that is an antigen. So it can, this, if this is an antigen, so mycobacterium tuberculosis will have, for example, maybe 300 antigens, maybe 700 antigens. A virus may have, because viruses are small in size, may have 50 different antigens. So we are talking about that much number and say one particular piece is here as an exposure and to which there is an immune response developed, so there is expansion. And this will take about a week for the reason that I mentioned that color matching is important and until that particular cell sees that particular color, there will not be expansion and hence there will be a time lag between the exposure and development of immune response. So this is immune response. This is not as yet memory. However, when there is a separate color code which has come up, another cell will expand. This cell will not expand to this. So this we talk as antigen specificity. So the blue cell will only recognize blue antigen and the red cell will recognize only red antigen, not otherwise. Uh, I keep saying this, I'm sorry, but there, this, all these statements are to be taken with small pinches of salt. As an immunologist, I'm making these statements, but I'm also aware about the limitations. So, but for you, I'm sure this is okay. So if what you saw from the, for the blue color is that there was expansion and when with time there was decrease in the cell number. So expanded cells contracted and what you see is that numbers which are more than the original but not as many as were expanded in the acute phase, these are the so-called memory cells. So memory frequency is always higher than the naive inexperienced cell frequency, but it is never as high as the expanded state. So all of this happens and then one year, so we are talking about exposure after everything is sort of cooled down. At this time point, one year later, the same antigen is seen here and what you see is that within two days, there is see, uh, large expansion of the clone. So this large expansion is because of the memory recall. This is what we need for vaccine to be effective. We want vaccine to generate memory so that this response can be obtained. This response is more rapid than this response that you saw earlier. So memory is more efficient. It has a larger potential to neutralize virus, to kill the cells, what, whichever is the effector function. And this is the way immune memory seems to operate. So <clears throat> if you are talking about immune memory now, this blue and this blue, I have given it as the same color. In terms of BCG vaccination, this came from BCG. But it is also a part of M tuberculosis, sharing of antigens or cross reactivity or sharing of proteins, whichever way we would call it. So even when BCG has been used for vaccination, there would be a recall memory response to M tuberculosis. Simple enough? Now think of another mycobacterium which is neither tuberculosis nor BCG but has the blue still the same outcome, blue is a blue, right? It, anti, the T cells or the B cells are not going to make distinction that this is M tuberculosis, I need to mount a response. This is mycobacterium W, which is not pathogenic, I don't need to mount response. They are not human beings, they don't think, they act, right? So this blue antigen, if it is present in a non-pathogenic mycobacterium as well, 
then essentially this is an expansion which is futile. It's not protective response, it is there. It is a uh, bystander effect in a sense. It happened because it was a specific event. Now, if there are many blues coming once away, then all the memory that was generated here may simply get exhausted, right? Cells are multiplying. I'm sure many of you know some what is described as hay flick limit. So a cell will multiply only so many times and after that it has no potential to multiply unless it turns cancerous. So this particular cell multiplied initially, then the daughter cells multiplied and so on and so forth. So ultimately all progeny of the blue cell got exhausted. As a result, when the real M tuberculosis comes to, uh, uh, is the culprit and is the exposure, there are no blue cells left. Possible? Hand waviness. These are clinical observations. All right, there are no real data. And modeling can be extremely useful in this, provided you have hard data. All I'm providing, providing you with is fodder to think, all right? So this is really hand waviness, but what is described is that if you have um, BCG vaccination, in the first few years, exhaustion is not reached. So whenever there is M tuberculosis infection, there is protection. But we are a tropical country. Mycobacterium W and many other mycobacteria are free living found in the air and in the soil, in the water, in the sand and so on and so forth. MW is just one example. There are many such mycobacteria which are non-pathogenic but which share some of the proteins with BCG or M tuberculosis. So this cross, this exposure of multiple mycobacteria actually results in making the BCG mediated immune memory um, lost, I mean exhausted. There are no immune memory cells left from this first BCG vaccination dose. Then you can imagine that now the adult pulmonary tuberculosis, which is what I was talking about, can happen so easily as if BCG effect is gone. Now the individual is again exposed. However, look at what is the immune status. Can you call it loss of uh, immune memory? Yes. Was this infection? Well, yes, it was infection with non-MTB mycobacteria, which led to exhaustion. Does that mean the population is going back to the sensitive stage? Possibly yes. Do we really know this is exactly what happens? No. But hand waviness and immunology together can provide you with these hypotheses. And what does hap what happens in UK? One sec. In UK, for example, where there are adequate data for these, that it's a cold country. So these free floating mycobacteria that you find in the warm air are not really there at, in that free, at that frequency because of which the memory cells which, were, which are generated possibly at this stage last for many, 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 many years. Simple minded explanation, you do the modeling now. I don't have, this is something that I keep talking about problems with vaccination, problems with ex, uh, explaining what the situations might be. And earlier in the morning, everybody talked about environmental factors and something else and temperature and humidity. All of that actually is relevant here. I don't know how to put it in equations at all. Large what? Okay, 
the problem with that is, is there a large expansion and exhaustion? That's what you, you are looking for. So multiple problems. We don't know how many colors are expanding on day one, meaning primary vaccination. We can't really identify all of them. If you, while there is antigen 85 or BSAT or CSAT, something, SAT, SAT B, it's not CSAT, SAT B, and some others are supposed to be protective for, uh, for pro providing protective immunity in mycobacteria, I don't know whether anybody has actually looked at how much of SAT B specific response there is at this point and whether there is that response which also you see when people come down with infection as adults. So this is something that can be done but is not easily doable. So that's why I said that yes, you can probably track but you can imagine babies which are vaccinated today, three weeks later or six weeks later you look at their all antigenic profile and 20 years later you look at their profile which becomes an experiment or which becomes an exercise which is not a research uh, exercise, it is actually an epidemiological exercise. Nobody will do it unless there is a health ministry based proper basic infrastructure in place to collect epidemiological data and having interesting offshoots of that. So I don't see it happening. <laughs> But that doesn't mean it's not a question that cannot be answered. What we are trying to do and have never managed to do it is essentially do this in mice. Give vaccination soon after uh, birth. You can't give vaccination to you know, mice soon after birth because their uh, immune system is not well developed, but say six to eight weeks. So you give him, uh, infection or vaccination at that point, then give repeat uh, exposures in, uh, in that sort of infections with related bacteria and or not in a control group and at the end of that look for the frequencies of specific T cells or uh, specific antibodies hasn't happened. So thinking of this as experimental models is a clear possibility but probably we tend to get bogged down in too many things of this kind. So don't have an answer. So that, that's the point that I wanted to make about the vaccination status and other stuff. Okay. So I think I've covered this. HIV infected patients, I'm sure there are better people here to talk about HIV than I am because I'm a real, real, real outsider. And Udranga, Uday was supposed to be here and I'm filling in for him. That does not mean I can talk about HIV. I will not. So... Leprosy, this is another peculiarity of the mycobacterial infection. For tuberculosis, at least there are sort of human models, uh, sort of animal models. For leprosy, there is practically none. Because M tuberculosis at least slowly grows in vitro and M lepri hardly ever grows. So that in itself is a problem. And there are many deletions in M tuberculosis genome or mycobacterial genome. So M lepri genome is smaller than M tuberculosis. Is that your raised hand on my name? <coughs> so the uh, M lepri is uh, causes disease and there are also public health issues which again in the context of modeling infectious diseases are important and I will touch upon them. So. Spectrum of the disease, I had mentioned for tuberculosis different ways, miliary, miliary and lymphadenitis and so on and so forth. Leprosy normally primarily affects skin and many other organs, but what you see is skin patches. That's how people come with you with symptoms and signs. And based on that, it is normally distribute, um, classified as <clears throat> lepromatous leprosy, borderline lepromatous, borderline tuberculous, tubercular and tubercular. <coughs> so this is a spectrum of the disease. So what you see in tubercular uh, TT leprosy, TT end of the spectrum, is that the patient has actually killed off most of the mycobacteria that are present. So if you take a skin biopsy from such a patient, you will find 
a lot of damage below the skin but no bacteria or very minimal bacteria what histopathologists would cause, call as plus one. In lepromatous leprosy, there will be damage, but there will, uh, the whole biopsy will be studded with mycobacteria, like four plus. So both are skin diseases, there will be big patches, there will be more damage in the, to the skin in TT end of the spectrum and than in the LL end of the spectrum, but there will be large number of bacteria in LL and sm very small in TT. Again, what decides whether a given individual will have, will manifest as LL versus TT? There are genetic factors, there are the dosage, meaning how many, the inoculum factor and so on and so forth. Nobody really knows because these are hard diseases to study. But what we know is that the facultative intracellular parasite killing strategy that I had mentioned, sorry, this one, this strategy that I had mentioned here, where tuberculosis and leprosy both are mentioned. So M tuberculosis and M leprosy, lepre both go and sit inside the vacuum and will survive there. And if that these are surviving, the way to kill them is to activate that particular infected cell to pour all sorts of noxious things inside the bubble to kill off. This is what is described as T helper one kind of response. I'm mentioning this, you don't have to worry about it, but it should not be the case that I have not mentioned it. This is the interferon gamma producing response of the T cells, CD4 T cells, helper T cells, which will help in killing the organisms, mycobacteria inside the cell. In LL kind of leprosy, instead of this gamma interferon kind of response, you get an other polar response, which is interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 producing response or called TH2 response. Same bacterium in two different hosts is producing two different kinds of responses. Why and how, we don't know. So because of that, this TH2 response, the bacteria inside the cells are not killed and in fact bacteria continue multiplying so much so that the cell actually die, cells die with necrosis, spread the mycobacteria around and the next generation of phagocytic cells will take it, spread it again and it continues. So if anybody has seen histopathology or read about histopathology, there are big patches of mycobacteria that you find in LL form of leprosy and no bacteria in the TT form of leprosy. In between was in between. So I won't go into the detail. It was just the spectrum that I was wanted to tell you about. Uh, okay. So the question is, can leprosy be prevented? by BCG vaccination. Simple enough question. And they are both mycobacteria, so there are shared antigens and hence it should be possible. <coughs> there are controversial reports about this. There was also an interesting bit and this is where uh, the first founding director of NII comes into picture, National Institute of Immunology, Professor Pran Talwar had tried, <coughs> killed mycobacterium W as a vaccine for treatment of tuberculosis, uh, treatment of leprosy. So there was a major clinical trial done and what was found was that you give the uh, medication that is required, Dapson, plus you give MW injections as intramuscular vaccine and the LL patients actually recovered very, very rapidly and went towards TT, so they got rid of the mycobacteria which seems to suggest that MW <coughs> can actually provide immune, trigger immune responses which will kill M lepre. Again cross reactivity but this kind of vaccination and BCG and M tuberculosis are not different in principle. So that is what he showed. <laughs> However, in while the vaccine was shown to be effective and everything, WHO declared under I keep saying this, I don't like to, but under various probably uh, people's pressures, people who matter, 
that leprosy is not a major disease. You give treatment for about six weeks or six months and then leprosy is cured. And suddenly India became more or less leprosy free. I don't think that is the reality. But now imagine that nobody can strongly recommend MW as a vaccine for LL leprosy because it is not a problem. This is WHO creation. We do see leprosy patients, but we cannot talk about it. So sometimes public health measures can be completely counterproductive. And this might actually mean that we will have subclinical, mind you, subclinical spread of M. lepre. And maybe we'll reach a stage that will be really unfortunate when we will have many more cases of leprosy. You had a hand raised? No? Sorry. I was imagining probably. So, <clears throat> uh, okay, that was the last point on, the, on that. <laughs> you can't grow M. lepre. <laughs> Only way you can grow is that was the armadillo vaccine. And so, Armadillo, uh, in armadillos, lep M. leprae could grow. And some people had tried growing those, harvesting those, and then using. But this is not really something that can be done. If they were growing in, in a culture medium, it would have been an option. But BCG vaccination seems to be at least partially effective. But now nobody will talk of that. Nobody will talk of MW because we don't have leprosy as a problem. So that's the sort of end of the matter, unfortunately. Uh, all right, so what am I wanting? This I covered. So in which are the components of? So the, the five year window in which you give BCG that protects against M. lepre, but the problem is after five years. Oh, M. TB. BCG is at birth and Correct. what is accepted is M it's a prevention, uh, it, it is for prevention of M tuberculosis mediated infection without any doubt. Some clinical trials have also shown that M lepre incidence goes down. However, we don't have enough data in uh, for childhood uh, population about how much is the incidence of leprosy. So we don't know whether BCG actually prevented that. You needed it before BCG was introduced and after. Don't have it. So that's why I keep saying that I feel very bad about lack of sound or any epidemiological data in this country. Bad situation, but what do you do? Uh, now I have to think about what is there. All right. So I was talking about two kinds of responses, which, no, not here. All right, so I said for the tuberculoid leprosy, what you see is an interferon gamma producing response. And for LL kind of leprosy, what you see is that IL-4, IL-5, IL-13 producing response. What are these? These are called cytokines. Cytos is cell and the cytokines are products of the cells. And these cytokines are produced here by T, T lymphocytes, dendritic cells, macrophages, all of which are involved in cell to cell interaction to promote T cell proliferation and T cell memory generation. So if these cytokines are produced locally, you can imagine that they will have effect locally. So remember I had shown long leg with lymph node drainage, so uh, lymphatic drainage. So from there, wherever it is, it is say in the lymph node that you can see these cytokines very easily or that you can find T cells which will produce these cytokines because they are locally multiplying all the bacteria or viruses in different contexts. They will come and uh, the phagocytosed no, cells which are phagocytose them will be sitting in the lymph node and then there will be expansion. So this is normally a localized response. It's not a systemic response unless, of course, the disease spreads so much that then everything is everywhere. So miliary tuberculosis, which I referred to and did not dwell on, miliary tuberculosis is systemic tuberculosis. 
in that you will find cytokines poured into the serum, into the plasma, into the blood, and essentially the child dies. It's very rare for the miliary tuberculosis uh, sufferers to re survive well. So this, this was the differentiation, so trying to take you to immune, uh, to immune responses but didn't want to do it too much because it was hard for me to cover many, many of these aspects. So I, I will, so Im Im uh, this I have more or less covered, but let's see. So consequences of infection and this I'm taking you back to the slide where I said infection, disease, chronic infection, chronic carrier state, death and so on. That slide which was black and white slide with multiple arrows. So this is sort of trying to connect with that slide. So saying that there is complete clearance of pathogen from the host, if you want to look at, achieve this, because to, uh, MTB is a facultative intracellular parasite, you would like not just CD4 T cell response, but a subset of that which is called TH1 response, which is interferon gamma producing response, which helps in killing intracellular parasites. If you have a TH2 response, uh, which, is, which leads to persistence of pathogen because the intracellular pathogen cannot be killed effectively. The monocyte macrophages which are harboring these dividing pathogens, those cells simply let bacteria grow because there is no interferon gamma and that's how there are consequences. So in both cases again, there will be generation of immunological memory because there was infection, there was triggering of immune response, so whether it is of this kind or that kind, there will be an automatic generation of immunological memory. But you can imagine that this TH1 kind of memory, if it is generated in response to M tuberculosis, it is likely to be protective for the reasons that I mentioned, that interferon gamma production, clearance of the intracellular bacteria, and hence effective survival of the host. In contrast, if there is a TH2 immune response, that's also immunological memory, but it will be a wasteful, wasteful in the sense non-usable, non-protective immunological memory. So when one is designing a vaccine, this is the point that needs to be kept in mind, that if you have a certain situation, you have de designed a vector or designed a uh, live attenuated organism which you are going to use for vaccination and so the question is, does BCG trigger a TH1 response? or does BCG trigger a TH2 response? That becomes a valid question. That if BCG was to trigger a TH2 response, nobody would have ever recommended BCG. Because then even the five year protection that we see in India would not have been possible. But if it was, uh, because it is TH1 producing in developed nations for long, long period and in India for five years, BCG still provides protection because it triggers a TH1 response. So the vaccine design is taken, I, in my judgment, a little too lightly, thinking that any immune response is a good response and what should be the readout for protective immune response is never clear. So in that context, I thought that I would harp on this point again that vaccine development and vaccine take and vaccine mediated protective response which is what the herd immunity is all about. Herd immunity is not any old response, herd immunity is about protective response. Unless you have protective response, there is no meaning for the word herd immunity. And the numbers that you saw from 90-95% to something like 40-60% um, population coverage is required to achieve herd immunity based on R values, R0 and other values, that again is sort of connected back here that you do need that protective response rather than any old immune response. Uh, this is only primarily for people who 
are not immunologists to sort of state it again. Uh, the advantages offered by memory are, as I said, it's a faster response. It's a quantitatively better response, which I did not highlight. It's qualitatively better response. And what you see is, for example, in B cell category, in B cells, there are responses, the uh, antibodies that the B cells or other plasma cells produce, which are of IgM kind or IgG kind. It's two broad categories. IgG antibodies have a much higher affinity. So if there are 15 particles of a virus, and if there is an IgM antibody molecule and an I IgG antibody molecules, then it's likely that higher antibody affinity, uh, antibodies with higher affinity would trap the virus more efficiently. It makes simple sense, simple logical sense. So that kind of qualitatively Im qualitative improvement is there as well. And IgG is normally a memory response. I forgot to mention that. IgM is normally a primary antibody response. IgG is a memory response. So that's why this qualitatively better response statement. And however, uh, there will be other problems as well. Maybe I'll mention it. Potential upper hand in host parasite interaction. And this you can easily imagine. Somebody was asking me about. Um, host parasite, meaning co-evolution, and maybe I'll bring it here a little bit, that you are looking for uh, potential upper hand over the parasite. And of course, today there is one M tuberculosis that, uh, that is the reason for exposure. And you know very well, for example, there are uh, multi-drug resistance, resistant and extremely drug resistant whatever, forgetting the names, but drug resistant mycobacteria. Those are small mutations. Those are not like major, major mutations. Parasite has achieved this to counter the host. So even if you have immune memory, it may or may not work. Because when I say it's a drug resistant, admittedly, it is the antibiotic or whichever, the drugs which are there, that those drug resistance, res resistance is being shown. But for organisms like mycobacteria, it's not just immune response, but antibiotics and immune response together help in faster clearance of the infection. So faster clearance aspect contributed by the antibiotics will completely go away. So in a sense, host is likely to lose and parasite is likely to survive, not because immune responses are compromised. In that sense, it's not a co-evolution. However, it's because the parasite has mutated and has gained advantage. So you have to remember that parasite, including mycobacteria, divide very, very rapidly as compared to host cells. Even if you look at the cells dividing, that is a very slow process, 16 hours, 18 hours, or if you're looking at um, co-evolution over millennia, then we reproduce every 20 years or something along those lines. So it is something that we are bound to lose. If there is a co-evolution to be looked at, the parasite has an advantage over the host so that host will always lose. What is the host strategy that we observe? Is this co-evolved? Possibly yes, over millennia. You do not see a single kind of immune response to any parasite. You will probably see 20 different epitopes to be recognized. There's a B cell response, CD4 T cell response, CD8 T cell response, innate immune response. All of these together are forming the front to counter the parasite. Is the parasite capable of evading all of these in one go? Unlikely. So something is countered, something else is still in place, and you will, it will be effective. So while co-evolution does happen, the ways that we, uh, in which these um, strategies are designed or possibly implemented, it's not designed as an active design, but this is how we see them in existence. That's how I think they tend to operate. You had asked this question, right? 
So that's, that's also the host parasite differences and the dynamics which is important. So in cases of filaria, for example, there is uh, interleukin 10 is another cytokine which is secreted. Filarial parasite secretes IL-10 like cytokine or IL-10 like product. That product will bind to IL-10 receptor, but it will prevent signaling. This is a parasite strategy to neutralize or counter the host machinery. These kinds of responses you do see and they are really at multiple levels. Viruses are more adept at it than bacteria because virus multiplication is even shorter duration of shorter duration and uh, parasites need longer duration. So you do see these kinds of gradations in the co-evolution if you want to uh, call that. can stop or memory exhaustion. I actually said this. Hmm. This will be the last slide and then I'll stop. You must have realized I went through the slides that were there. <laughs> There are some other even more random ones. Uh, so principles of vaccine design. So I've harped repeatedly on protective immune responses. But what you must realize is the difference of in the immune response one would like to have in the vaccine versus in the real infection. In the real infection, there is risk of parasite overpowering host immune system or not letting the host immune system res uh, respond properly and hence us as host reaching disease state. And disease is certainly morbidity that we are talking about. So that is something that uh, is associated with real life infection and disease scenario. So what do you need to do as a host? one needs to curtail, contain the um, replication potential of the uh, invader and mount an immune response so that everything is under control. And of course, if the host survives this acute infection, then and only then memory is useful. If I die because of a very severe infection, even if I have generated tons of immunological memory, what use is it that? So what is the primary concern? Have very strong effector response to control infection. Think of future if and when there is time. Now look at the vaccine scenario. I said even for live attenuated vaccine, there should be no disease which means that early acute strong phase in which containment of the infectious agent is so essential in real life infection that is not a necessity for vaccine. Because that vaccine you will never use in, in the humans if it was so risky. Ordinary chugging along is fine. All that you need from a vaccine is actually just memory. So now the question for people who are into real vaccine design is that is it, a possible, is it possible to trigger an immune response in which the early component is spared and memory generation is preferred? In infection, you would want exactly the reverse. You do want acute component, early component pro for protection and memory is a byproduct, useful but byproduct. Only if you survive you will use it. So these, the balance that earlier I had shown uh, and the host immune response, I mean host parasite interaction also is operative in a reverse manner in vaccination strategies versus protection from infection 
strategies that the host immune system should think of. That here one wants acute response uh, too much, uh, very strongly and no memory or little memory and for vaccine lots of, uh, lots of memory and very little immediate response. So do, do people think of these strategies and what do we need to think of? The cells which are triggered by the vaccine should live very, very long. They don't need to go through multiple rounds of uh, pro proliferation very early on, but they should survive for so long that as and when required, they will really be able to, uh, to, pro to um, proliferate and provide protection. That's one angle which is also missing, but there are many angles in immunology which are equally missing. So uh, that's the point that I wanted to make about immediate response to infection versus immunological memory. And the, this is the point that I would again refer to. Here the talk is about mathematical modeling and I also indulge myself in models, but they are of animal nature. So almost by in today's date, probably 60, 70 percent of my work is on animal models, not necessarily of infectious disease, but what I said about immunological memory just now, that can I devise ways in which memory cells would be longer lasting as uh, following vaccination as compared to simple immunization and survival of the memory cells. Those kinds of issues are also something that one can handle using animal models for, uh, and those could be animal models, I can call them animal models for vaccination. In simple minded terms, I simply say, I look at basic immunology as an example, basic immunology to understand issues about T cell memory generation and survival. It is very relevant for vaccine strategy design. However, I can't bring myself to promise saying I'm developing a vaccine because I'm not. I'm trying to understand the basics which will help in doing that. But these are the basics that also are important for mathematical modelers because they, th those also sort of get connected in, in different ways. And Clinical trials in humans as experimental animals are simply unethical and that is why people like me tend to work on animal models and draw measured conclusions rather than sort of jumping up and down and saying that this is what I would like to do. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. as much as I have exhausted or tired of my voice. So let's thank Vinita again, especially since we really pushed her very hard to give three lectures in a row. It's very nice of her. <coughs> so um, now there's a longish break. Dinner will be around 7.15, 7.30 in the same place where we had lunch. And that's for the people staying here in, in our guest house as well as the people staying at the hotel. And after that, there'll be a car that takes you back to the hotel. The hotel should send that. Okay? Um, what can you do now between now and 7.15? Um, one is walk around if it's not too wet. You can use go to the library. I think the library closes for external use by about 5.45, 6. So there's still a little bit of time. You just need to have some idea and to sign in. The nice place to sit is on the fourth floor of this building, right at the top, there's a coffee room at the end. So you can sit there, log on to your, to your uh, email or whatever it is, wait there, there and until dinner time. So I'll see you tomorrow. Come here around 9.15, 9.20, and then we'll go up from here to the computer room. Thank you.